Lord Russell, what do you mean by taboo morality? Well, I mean the sort of morality that consists in giving a set of rules, mainly as to things you must not do, without giving any reasons for those rules. And sometimes uh, no reasons could be found, other times they could. But in any case, the rules are considered absolute. Uh, these things you must not do. What sort of things? Well, now, uh, it depends on the level of civilization. Taboo morality is the primitive kind. It uh, is the only kind, I think, in primitive tribes, where, for example, it would be a rule, you must not eat out of one of the chief's dishes. Uh, if you do, you'll probably die, so they say. And uh, there are all sorts of rules of that sort. I remember the king of Tahomey had a rule that he must not look long in any one direction, because if he did, there would be tempests in that part of his dominions. And so there was a, a, a rule. He must always be looking round. But uh, those are sort of taboos from what we, I suppose, consider primitive societies. What about our own? Well, our own uh, morality is just as full of taboos. There are lots of things, uh, well, uh, even in the most august things. Now, there is one uh, sin, definitely recognized to be a sin, which I have never committed. It says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ox. Now, I never have. But uh, I don't... Uh, quite see what harm I should do if I did. Yes, but what about more sort of matter of fact or everyday rules than that? Are there, are there examples of, of taboo morality? Oh, yes, that? and of course a great deal of taboo morality is entirely compatible with what one might call rational morality. Uh, for instance, that you shouldn't steal or you shouldn't murder. Uh, those are uh, um, precepts that are entirely in accord with reason. But they are set forth as taboos. And when they're set forth as taboos, they have consequences that they ought not to have. For instance, in the case of murder, it's considered that it forbids euthanasia, which I think a rational person would be in favor of. But do you put in the, in the category of taboo morality things like um, Hindus saying you shouldn't eat beef? And Jews yes, saying those are pork. typical things of Hindu morality. That, uh, Hindu says you shouldn't eat beef. The uh, Mohammedan and the Jew says you mustn't eat pork. And uh, there's no reason for that. It's just a, a taboo. But you don't think these taboos serve any useful purpose? Some do and some don't. It all depends. I mean, uh, if you get a rational basis for your ethic, you can then look into the taboos and see which are useful. But the prohibition of beef, I should say, it doesn't do any good at all. It only means that... Uh, a large number of cattle have to die very painful deaths. Now, if you don't believe in religion, and you don't, and if you don't, on the whole, think much of the assorted rules thrown up by taboo morality, do you believe in any system of ethics? Yes, but it's very difficult to separate ethics altogether from politics. Uh, ethics, it seems to me, arises in this way. Uh, a man is inclined to do something which benefits him and harms his neighbor. Well, if it harms a good many of his neighbors, they will combine together and say, look, we don't like this sort of thing. We will see to it that it doesn't benefit the man. And that leads to the criminal law, which is perfectly rational. It's a method of harmonizing the general and private interest. But uh, isn't it, though, rather inconvenient if everybody goes about uh, with his own kind of private system of ethics instead of accepting a general one? It would be, if that were so, but in fact they're not so private as all that because, uh, as I was saying a moment ago, they get embodied in the criminal law and apart from the criminal law, in public approval and disapproval. People don't like to incur public disapproval. And in that way, the accepted code of morality becomes a very potent thing. But is there such a thing as sin? No, I, I think sin, it's difficult to define. If you mean merely undesirable actions, of course there are undesirable actions. And when I say undesirable, I mean that they're actions which uh, 
on the balance, do more harm than good. And of course there are. But I don't think sin is a useful conception. I think sin, the essence of what people mean when they talk of sin, is that it is a positive good to punish the man who does this sort of thing. That you should punish murderers not only because you want to prevent murder, but because the murderer deserves to suffer. But are you saying that sin is really an excuse for cruelty in many cases? I think very largely. I mean, I think only cruel people could have invented hell. People with humane feelings would not have liked the thought that those who do on earth things which are condemned by the morality of their tribe will suffer eternally without any chance of amendment. I don't think decent people would have ever adopted that view. But you mean the concept of sin is really a chance to get one's aggressive feelings out? Yes, I think so. It's uh, the essence of uh, what you might call a stern morality is uh, to enable you to inflict suffering without a bad conscience. And therefore, I think it's a bad thing. But then how are we to disapprove of things if we don't accept the proposition that there is such a thing as a sin? Well, the disapproval in itself, uh, combined with the criminal law, does, I think, all that you can do. Uh, you have to have a certain kind of public opinion. Now, you will see how important that is if you read uh, the histories of the Italian Renaissance, the sort of histories that produced uh, uh, Machiavelli's theories, where uh, public opinion tolerated things which, uh, in most times, public opinion would not tolerate. Would you agree, there that some things are wicked? I shouldn't like to use that word. I should say some things do more harm than good. And uh, if you know that they're going to do more harm than good, uh, well, uh, you better not do them. And if you like to use the word wicked, you can, but I don't think it's a useful word. Uh, a large part of uh, taboo morality affects sexual relations and a good deal of your writings has been devoted to this particular problem. How would you say that people who want to live sensibly so far as sex is concerned, how should they conduct themselves? Well, I should like first to say by way of preface that uh, only about 1% of my writings is concerned with sex. But uh, the uh, conventional public is so obsessed with sex that it hasn't noticed the other 99% of my writings. I should like to say that to begin with, and I think 1% is a reasonable proportion of human interest to assign to that subject. But um, I should uh, deal with sexual morality exactly as I should with everything else. I should say, uh, if what you're doing does no harm to anybody, there's no reason to condemn it. And uh, you shouldn't condemn it merely because some uh, ancient taboo has said that this is wrong. You should look into whether it does any harm or not. And uh, that's uh, the basis of sexual morality as of all other. Would you say then that rape is to be condemned, but ordinary fornication, provided that it didn't hurt anybody, is not necessarily to be condemned? Uh, yes, I should certainly say that uh, rape is just like any other uh, bodily violence. Uh, as for fornication, well, you'd have to look into the circumstances to see whether there was on this occasion a reason against it or whether there wasn't, but not a block condemnation always and under all circumstances. But do you think that it's um, right to have rules about what can and can't be published well, that's a question on which I feel rather an extreme position, a position that I'm afraid very few people agree with. I think there ought to be no rules whatever prohibiting uh, improper publications. I think that uh, partly because if there are any rules, stupid magistrates will condemn really valuable work 
because it happens to shock them. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is that I think prohibitions immensely increase people's interest in uh, pornography as in anything else. Uh, I used often to go to America during prohibition and there was far more uh, drunkenness than there was before, far more. And I think the prohibition of pornography has much the same effect. Now, i give you an illustration of what I mean about prohibitions. The philosopher Empedocles thought it was very, very wicked to munch laurel leaves. And he laments that he will have to spend 10,000 years in outer darkness because he'd munched laurel leaves. Now, nobody's ever told me not to munch laurel leaves, and I've never done it. But Empedocles, who was told not to, did do it. And I think the same applies to pornography. But do you think, then, that if everything that anybody wanted to write of an obscene nature were to be published, this, in fact, would not increase people's interest at all? I think it would diminish it. I think, uh, suppose, for instance, filthy postcards were permitted. I think for the first year or two, there would be a great demand for them, and then people would get bored and nobody would look at them again. And this would apply to writings and so on as well? I think so. Uh, within the limits of what is sensible. I mean, if it was a fine piece of art, a fine piece of work, the people would read it, but not uh, because it was pornographic. To come back to the basis of what we've been talking about, the unthinking rules of taboo morality, what harm do you think they do? Well, they do two different sorts of harm. Let's say those of them which are not rationally justifiable. One sort of harm is that they are usually ancient and come down from a different sort of society from that in which we live, where really a different ethic was appropriate, and very often they're not at all appropriate to modern times. Uh, I think that applies in particular to artificial insemination, which is a thing that uh, the moralists of the past hadn't thought of, and uh, there was no provision for it in their morality. That's one sort of thing. Another is that uh, they tend to perpetuate ancient cruelties. Now, I could give several examples of that. Uh, take, for instance, human sacrifice. Uh, the Greeks at a very early period in their history, began to turn against human sacrifice, which they had practiced. And uh, they wanted to abolish it. But uh, there was one institution which didn't want it abolished and stuck up for it through thick and thin, and that was the Oracle at Delphi. It made its living out of superstition, and it didn't want superstition diminished. And so it stood up for human sacrifice long after other Greeks had given it up. That's one example. Now, I could give you another example, which really was of some importance. Uh, it had always been held that uh, to uh, cut up a corpse was extraordinarily wicked. Uh, Vesalius, who was a very eminent uh, doctor in the time of the Emperor Charles V, uh, realized that you couldn't... Uh, really do a great many valuable medical things unless you dissected corpses. And so he used to dissect corpses. Now, the Emperor Charles V was a valetudinarian and thought this was the only doctor who would keep him well. So he protected him. But after the Emperor had abdicated, there was nobody to protect him. And uh, he was uh, condemned for having dissected a body which they said was not quite dead and it was condemned as a penalty to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. On the way he got shipwrecked and died of hardship and that was the end of him. And all this because there was this taboo against cutting up corpses. But what harm do you think taboo morality is doing today? And if it is doing it today, what ought we to do about it? Well, it certainly is doing harm today. Uh, take, uh, for example, the question of birth control. There's uh, a very powerful taboo by uh, certain sections of the community, which is calculated to do very enormous harm, very enormous harm. It is calculated to promote poverty and war. Uh, 
And uh, to make the solution of many social problems impossible, uh, that's, uh, I think, perhaps the most important. Then I think there are a number of others about, well, the indissolubility of marriage. There are all sorts of taboos of that sort that seem to me to be quite definitely harmful and to be based solely upon ancient tradition and not upon an examination of present circumstances.